Faith Chapel, please put your hands together and thank everyone who participated in the opening torch ceremony, the trumpeters, Word in Motion, and Family Ministry Dancers. Welcome to the passing of the torch ceremony, an historic and monumental event for our church. On this day, our senior pastor, Dr. Mike Moore, with the support of his wife, Mrs. Kenitha Moore, will pass the torch of leadership to their son, Michael Kenneth Moore, and he will become the lead pastor of Faith Chapel. At this time, please put your hands together and welcome Michael Kay and Michelle Scott Moore into the service. You can do better than that, church. You may take your seats. Faith Chapel, we should always seek to have amazing friends to support us through our journey. We are so grateful that Michael K has had so many wonderful people in his help in his life to help mold, shape, and prepare him for this very moment. Tonight we begin this by saying, Thank you, God, for such a wonderful gift you've given us, Michael Kenneth Moore. We also want to say thank you, God, for Pastor Stephen Chandler being his mentor, Tony Morgan for being his leadership coach, Dr. Mike, Dr. Mike and Kanitha Moore for being his phenomenal senior pastors, parents, and teachers, Tiffany Moore for being his loving, supportive, and awesome sister, Michelle Scott Moore. Let me say that again, Michelle Scott Moore for being the solid rock beside him. And last but not least, thank you all for, thank you all for here, who are here in person and online for pouring into the life of Michael K and helping him to become the man of God he is today. Thank you. As you go through life, you will meet many people but only a few will make a lasting impression on your hearts and minds. These people will always listen and talk to you. They will care about your happiness and well-being. They will like you for who you are, and they will support you at all times. It is these people that you think of often and will always remain an import, important part of your life. But the best part about it all is you can call them friend. Got you. So um, I met Michael K when we were at Bonfield Junior High School, and we were in the band. Uh, I played the saxophone. Do y'all know what he played? The clarinet. <laughs> he played <laughs> the clarinet. And so here I am playing the saxophone. Is, is there a dude in the clarinet section? <laughs> that's Michael K. <laughs> that was Michael K. And so um, that's when, um, when he and I became close. Um, and we got really close senior year in high school. We would just hang out and just get something to eat and just catch up. Uh, Craig, you was at Howard, I was at Auburn, Michael K was up at UAH. We would come home and just talk about our experiences. People we were meeting, um, all the fun we was having, um, all the studying we were doing um also like we, but we would just bond and every time we come home it was almost mandatory that we get together and catch up and i think that's where the bond began to really grow 
And I think a little bit after college, that's where you begin to come into the play. I remember uh, Michael Kay going to UAH and it's crazy because initially, just being honest, I wasn't trying to get to know him like that. And what happened was um, I actually went over his house with a group of brothers one time and we had a really strong, really good conversation, just really bonded. And I was like, this guy's is actually really, really cool down to earth. And so we just started hanging out. I started hanging out with Craig and uh, Caesar, who I call Jay. And we just kept that bond going. It just, it turned into something bigger than all of us actually. And uh, I've been thankful ever since. What kind of friend has Michael K become to me? He has uh, actually become my best friend, one of my best friends. These are my brothers here. These are my best friends, my brothers. Um, He's become one of my best friends. He's been a big, big part of my life. He, uh, he's been there in a lot of high times in my life. Uh, he's been there in a lot of low times in my life. Michael K is kind of like, basically like a brother in a sense. Um, one of the things that I really gravitated to him is because with my background, he related a lot to that. I grew up in a very Christian background as he did, obviously. So there was a connection there. Um, so, but just someone that good sense of humor. Um, I know he seems real serious to everyone cause he's in, he's in pastor mode and whatnot, but very laid back, chill guy, very just, just, we've had a lot of fun. He's just been a rock solid friend to me. That's all I got over the years. Uh, we, we've grown up together from junior high to high to adults now to family men. He's just been a rock solid friend to me. When did we realize that he wanted to be a minister? First of all, we're not supposed to be here because growing up, Michael K never expressed that he wanted to be a pastor. And in fact, he shunned it. No, oh, man, that ain't me, man. I don't, I don't, I don't see that happening with me. And uh, one day he told me, hey man, I'm calling and let you know, I've been called to preach. I said, about who? Cause this ain't, this isn't on the agenda. He said, I, I, I was reading the book of Ezekiel and it's like the, the words jumped off the page. And I said, oh, okay. You know, oh, okay. <laughs> and to watch him come into that um, is remarkable. Cause again, this was not on the agenda. It wasn't on his agenda. It started in college. Mm -hmm. So in college, you know, you had a nickname for me too. Yeah. Um, I had become yeah. president of a campus ministry. And then Mike, if you remember, he started getting involved with his church up in Huntsville. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so his spiritual life began to really, he began to develop his own spiritual walk. And so that was a first glimpse of it. I remember talking with Mike and he he didn't seem like that was the path he was trying to go down. Right. Like it was just like, hey, you know, that's my dad. That's not really right. what I'm trying to do. And I right. remember he started working. You guys remember he worked for uh, Wrigley. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he's like, man, I'm doing my thing at Wrigley. Yeah. Well, I remember uh, we were talking one day and he told me uh, there was this lady, uh, she was driving real slow on the interstate and he was trying to hurry up to get to one of his vendors, his uh, places. Yeah. And she was, every time she moved, he he moved, she would move and he just, she slowed him down from getting there. And so mm. I remember he told me, he said, it's crazy because he was so frustrated, but when he got there because he was delayed by so much, the place had just gotten robbed. Mm. And so he started thanking God because he's just like, man, you know, this lady I was just upset about actually was God trying to keep me from getting it, you know, there at the time. So he was just like, man, Terry, I don't, I don't think really for me, man. I don't think I, <laughs> but it's funny that you brought up that scripture about Ezekiel because he told me that same thing. He yeah. said, man, you know, I was reading in the Bible and, you know, reading the book of Ezekiel and the word jumped out. And I was like, wow, yeah. okay, yeah. you know, well, you know, if, if that's what God asked you to do, yeah. you know, I mean, do what you do, brother, do what you do. You know, the, the, the cool thing about about Michael K is he didn't really, as wise as he was, he didn't really impose himself yes. on us. Yes. He kind of just modeled, he kind of modeled being a good guy yes. for us. You know what I mean? Yes. And, and so, and I think, I think that was one of the things we appreciated a lot about him is, you know, he gave us our space. Um, if we came to him about something, you know, he would he would give us some some insight. But I think it was his example that stood out the most. I uh, excitement, 
uh, very happy for him. Uh, really looking forward to the things that God is going to do through him to help bless all of us and the rest of the church. Uh, I guess just a lot of excitement, a lot of happiness, love. Um, that's the, those are the words that come to mind for me. For me, just proud, just so proud of him, man. Like, again, to your point, this is something that he's ran from <laughs> quite some time. And I get it because it can be, Pastor Mike right. is an exceptional human right. being. Right. 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 I mean, a lot of a lot of a lot of your favorite pastors you see on TV don't do a fraction. They do a fraction of what we see Pastor Mike do every Sunday. Right. So to see that, I can understand why you would run from that. You know, especially if you're trying to be your own person. So to see him develop a relationship with God. And to see him embrace this, grow in it, because he's grown just by just speaking and, and, and ministering. We've seen his growth and evolution. So to see this culminate in this, I'm proud of him. I'm so excited for him. So it's definitely something I'm looking forward to. I'm, I'm excited for him as well. But I, I think that biggest challenge, I don't think for him though, is following his dad. Because yeah, those sure. are some huge footsteps, but I don't think it's a challenge for him. It may be a challenge for others because you're so used to this top-notch teacher, sure. and so he's not his dad. Right. He, he's 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 Simba. He's not Mufasa. Woo! Woo! What a word! What a word! What a word! He's Simba. He's not Mufasa. And so he can't be his dad. He's going to have some of his ways, but he, he he's going to be fine with that with that pattern. But it may be others. He comes a comparison, and I think they they did messages on that. Watch that comparison. Uh, yeah, but 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 where he is, where he's going, I'm 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 happy for him. It's going to be good. Please give these friends a hand. Faith Chapel, as our director of worship, Nitra Young, always says, you ready to worship? Please welcome our special guest, Tim Bowman, Jr. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Oh, come on, I thought y'all was a faith church. Well, am I in the house that faith built? Am I in an environment where we can believe it, speak it, and watch it manifest? Well, come on, tap your neighbor and say, neighbor, if you're going to sit next to me. Oh, come on, y'all got to talk. I said, neighbor, if you're going to sit next to me, we're going to be intentional about believing God for something to manifest before we leave here tonight. See, anything is possible in an environment like this. If you believe in God for something, just take a 10-second praise break. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. We're not waiting for it to manifest tomorrow or next week. When we leave here tonight, it is so. Somebody shout, I believe. I believe. That I receive everything that belongs to me. Listen to me. I am so excited to be here tonight. I bring you greetings from my pastor, Dr. Mike Freeman, um, from Spirit of Faith. Where is Pastor Mike? There you are, sir. You know he wanted me to tell you, him and Dr. Didi, that they love you and Pastor Peace so much. Um, you guys are generals in the faith. Um, you guys have taught not just um, the uh, baby boomer generation, but then my generation, and then now we got MK here. I mean, the family got so much spiritual swag. Can we give it up for the one of the swaggiest first families in the world? MK? Is it MK? I love you so much. No, no, it's MK and Michelle. Good to see you. You look like a million dads. Okay, I'm ready to party tonight. Tonight signifies so many good things. Yep. A passing of the torch. Yep. 
But it's amazing that one can pass a torch in such prosperity as such. You know, isn't this a blessing that we're standing in the fruit of pastors, apostleship? Sir, we honor you so much. Okay, y'all, I'm ready to party, but look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't know if you realize it yet or if you can even sense it yet, but you are standing next to an overcomer. That wasn't the right neighbor. Find somebody who's been through something and come out successful. Okay, some people got it over here. Look at somebody else and say, neighbor. Stow your head back and say, oh, neighbor. I don't know if you can sense it yet, but you're standing next to a walking, talking, moving miracle. Because if I can lift my hands after the two years we've just come out of, yep, yep. What does that say about the God I serve? Yep. I just got a question for you. I'm ready, PJ. What's his name? Yep. Jesus. What's his name? Jesus. Put your hands on it like this, y'all. Put your hands on him. This ain't nothing but a Jesus party tonight. Somebody make some noise in here. Is there anybody here that loves Jesus? Anybody here that loves Jesus?
some of y'all. I'm looking at some. Some of y'all still got a little club on you. That's all right. We get you. We get you. We get you. <laughs> you you, you will keep it. Stay with me, y'all. So what I need y'all to do, when y'all got to the club, we would see y'all on the dance floor, uh-huh. and we would see you in the middle of the dance floor doing something like this. Show a PJ like this. The fact that I can lift my hands is reason enough to blow the roof off of this place. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Everybody go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see you, baby. Come on, what's that? Send us to Jesus. go to another level. See, see, I gotta, I gotta excuse me because I'm a young man, but I don't know if you can tell yet, but I got an old soul. And I'm feeling a little churchy tonight. Anybody remember testimony service? PJ, take me to F. It was right around this time in the service, y'all. First lady, I'ma see if they remember this. When my grandmama would jump to her feet and she said, everybody clap your Oh, somebody get them hands in the air. Everybody clap.
trying to keep myself together. Can yeah. you lift your hands all over this room? Any worshipers in this room tonight? My wife is watching. I love you, Pastor Breland. I always ask that question because we must be intentional when we answer that question. I've had the privilege of traveling the world, singing of the great gospel that we read and that we've submitted our lives to. And I'll never forget, Pastor, I was in a city and there were thousands of people there. And they were crying out and they were running and shouting. And as our old post, uh, folks used to say, snot and carry no. And I stepped back from the mic stand just like this and I said, God, you must be pleased. This is amazing. And in the moment, Holy Spirit told me and showed me what I thought was a sweet smelling savor that was being offered up was a foul smelling stench. So I'm sitting here like, okay, this is wild. How is this foul? Well, he said, go back to my original intent concerning worship. And when you go in the Bible, you will never find worship coinciding with music. You hear it with praise and you see it with praise. So subsequently, we lift our hands and call each other worshipers because during this corporate gathering, we lift our hands and we cry out. But on the way home, when the McDonald's attendant gets your fries wrong, you cuss them out. Somebody shout, the devil is a liar. He's given us two commandments concerning worship. If you're going to engage, they that worship me must worship me in. Somebody shout spirit. Somebody shout truth. So in researching, I found out it was foul because far too many of us come in here and we lift our hands out of desperation and not revelation. We we pretty much got the spirit thing covered. This is a spiritual matter. We know we have to war in the spirit. But we come in here with bank accounts that read zero. And we come in here and cry out, God, I need you to do a financial miracle if I don't do it I'm going to get evicted I'm not going to be able to pay my student loans when the truth of the matter is you're a lender and not a borrower you're an heir to the throne you're a royal priesthood he said you are above only and not beneath so when the sensory realm says cancer we stand on the fact that with every strike that he took, I was healed. My job is to lift my hands and believe it to be so. Somebody shout spirit. Somebody shout truth. Tonight we engage differently. We lift our hands for the simple fact that he's good. Somebody say, God, I trust you. I trust you that where I stand, in spite of the sensory realm, I stand in victory. So when the world says my portion is anxiety, I lift my hands and say, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. See, this big boy and big girl stuff tonight, feelings go to side. Because what I know about the scripture, it says, it may look like I am covered, but I am covered by you, Lord. Say, it may look like I'm surrounded, but all I see is the angels that have been dispatched to cover me because he's gone before me to the left and to the right. He's already prepared a table for me. So it may look like I'm surrounded by. Is anybody surrounded by Jesus? So with every hand lifted in this room to the virtual audience, you lift your hands in spite of everything that's going around and you declare, this is how I fight my battles. Somebody stretch your hands right there and declare that you said,
See, I found out, Pastor, that a taught church is a healthy church. Y'all are trained. This is how Faith Chapel fights their battle. We gotta sit down. But before I do, we gotta make a massive choir in here real sweet. Come on, you say. Singers, this is a worshiper. Say, This is what we've assembled to do. Say, Oh, that's not. Chapel, help me welcome our special guest, Stephen Chandler, senior pastor of Union Church to Birmingham and to Faith Chapel. Everybody. Come on, can you praise the Lord, everybody? This is um, not just a celebration, but this is a divine moment. This is a moment where God's presence is here, where he is doing in the supernatural things that we cannot see, but is going to impact not just our lives, but generations after generations after generations. I uh, first want to honor Dr. Mike and Lady Kanitha. This is 
amazing. <laughs> I pulled on this property and I said, this is a place of faith. This is a place where God has done miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. And we honor you and we thank God for your sacrifice. We thank God for the battles that you fought that your children will not have to fight because you found victory in them. Me and apparently it's uh, Pastor MK. Uh, he's Michael to me, but uh, MK and his house uh, are, are good friends. And I uh, became the senior pastor of my dad's church uh, 11 years ago. And uh, as a pastor's kid, and if you don't know me, you're gonna find out, I'm, I'm just kinda, I shoot straight. Uh, I gave my dad a hard time. <laughs> And I'm like, man, if I was the pastor, I'd have done this, and I'd have done that, and you're doing this wrong, and you shouldn't have done this, and you should have done that. And, and after about 12 months of pastoring his church, I came back on my hands and knees, <laughs> and I said, I had no idea the battles that you had to fight, and you did it with grace, and you did it with honor, and I want to honor you because nobody in this room knows the tears that you've cried, the battles that you've fought. But you did it with grace, you did it with faith, you did it with honor, and we honor. Come on, can you honor the senior and founding pastor? Hallelujah. We thank God for you. I, uh, I hate running. If you see Stephen Chandler running, call the police. Somebody's chasing him. Somebody's trying to kill him. But I did a little bit of research to figure out what's the fastest a human has ever ran around a track. A track is 400 meters around, and the fastest a human has ever ran around a track is 43.03 seconds. That's one human. That's a fast 400 meters. Probably take me about 10 minutes. <laughs> but that's one human running around by themselves. The fastest humans have ever gone around a track is the Jamaican team in 2012, where they went around in 36.84 seconds. Because what you can do together is always bigger and stronger than what one can do by themselves. I'm in a room full of preachers, so you can preach this to yourself, but when you're running a race by yourself, you have to go from no motion to motion. But when you're grabbing the baton in a relay, you get a running start because you have to match the momentum of the person that's getting ready to pass the baton to you. And what we're getting to witness is Pastor MK and Pastor Michelle, you are getting a running start on maximizing all that God has given your family. And we celebrate you. We celebrate this moment. A lot of people don't know this, but the greatest king Israel ever had was not David. It wasn't Saul. If you talk about territory controlled, the greatest king Israel ever had was Solomon because Solomon was able to unify Israel and Judah. And per square footage, Solomon ruled more territory and more people than any other king in the history of Israel. And it wasn't because of Solomon's wisdom. It wasn't because of his anointing. And we all know it wasn't because of his holiness. <laughs> it was because of the way that his father set him up. And it was because of the head start that he got. And Pastor MK, I'm just telling you, and Pastor Michelle, y'all are about to take over the world. Birmingham ain't big enough to contain all that God is getting ready to do in your life. And it's because there's a generational blessing that is arresting on your lives tonight. I close with 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 20. And it says, David also said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do the work. If I had time to preach, I would tell you how the anointing of God doesn't exclude us from work. You've got to do the natural so he can put his super on top of it. There's going to be some work that's waiting for you on Monday. Do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged. There are going to be some situations that you face that are going to, deter, that are going to intimidate you. That are going to put you in a position of, do I have what it takes? Here's what he said. God's with you. The God of your father is with you. He will not fail you. He will not forsake you. There's always shadiness in scripture. Until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord 
is finished. I got to ask God, is he going to forsake them after the work is finished? But he said, as long as you're doing the work of the temple, God will not fail you. He will not forsake you. Don't worry about the economy. Don't worry about who's with you. Don't worry about who's against you. Don't worry about what the government says. God is with you. He will not fail you. You are favored and anointed and blessed by the Lord. I love you. God bless you. Love you, Faith Chapel. sharing those amazing words about our soon-to-be lead pastor. Now, welcome our founding and senior pastor, Dr. Mike Moore. be seated. Good evening, everyone. I want to, I want to thank all of you for, uh, I want to thank all of you for coming out here. This is a monumental uh, time in our church history. I, um, I shared with the church that there were three monumental events that has taken place in the 41 years that I've been pastor. The first monumental event was April the 26th, 1981. We started the church with four people in our den. The second monumental event that took place in our church was the building of this facility. It was not the building per se, that was monumental. It was the fact that God showed us and proved to us that he could provide for his provision. That this building was built debt free. And, and, I, and I'll say this, I'll say this, we never saw the money. We never, I, we had never had that much money come through the church. It was monumental, not because of the brick and the mortar. It was monumental because God was speaking to us that this was his vision and that he could provide for it Amen. through the history of the church. And the third monumental event in the 41 years of our church is tonight. Amen. It's tonight. It's, it's, it's tonight. I want to introduce our speaker, um, Thomas Beavers. And, and his wonderful wife are here today. He pastors New Rising Star Church. He is Michael's friend, and, and he they actually graduated together, went different paths, and now they're going to pastor together. I heard him talking about transition. He was talking about the transition of himself into his grandfather's church. And when I heard him talk, I knew that he should speak at this event. He is brilliant, he is anointed, Amen. he is godly, yes, sir. he is a rising voice that God is going to use all over the world. Yes, yes. Amen. I love this man of God, Amen. I love him. And I want you to stand to your feet and welcome Pastor Thomas Beavers, New Rising Star Church. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. side to the west side. 
God, you are worthy to be praised. This is the night that you have made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. God, we ask you right now that you will be glad to give all boldness of speech to the play of the mysteries of your gospel, except you see it. It won't be said, except you teach it, it won't be taught, except you preach it, it won't be preached, except you do it, it won't be done. God, we ask on tonight that you open our ears that we may hear you, open our eyes to see you, open our hearts to receive you, open our minds and grant us understanding, prompt us to study on our own. Don't let us leave this place the same way that we've come, but let us leave forever changed. God, we thank you for what you're doing in this August body of believers right here at Faith Chapel in Birmingham and in Columbus and who knows where else. God, we thank you for the foundation that has been planted. We thank you for Dr. Michael Moore. We thank you right now for Pastor MK and Lady Michelle. Thank you for Lady Peach, Father God. We just thank you for the legacy on tonight. God, we ask that you have your way in the mighty evangelist name of your darling son, Jesus the Christ, son of the living and loving God who's able to do absolutely anything but fail and who's already done it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, and amen. Come on, put those hands together. Give God a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm super duper excited to be here on tonight. Pastor Michael K., I honor you on tonight. Lady Michelle, I honor you on tonight. Your beautiful children, I honor you on tonight. Dr. Michael D. Moore, Lady Pete, I honor you on tonight. You could have chosen anybody in the world to do this on tonight, but I thank God that God laid me upon your heart to be here on tonight. That being said, ladies and gentlemen, I am Thomas Beavers. I pastor the New Rising Star Church, affectionately known as the Star, right here in the beautiful and the magic city of Birmingham, Alabama. Our church is 59 years of age. In 59 years, we've had four pastors. My grandfather, Dr. Tommy Chappelle, who transitioned from earth into eternity, March the 25th of 2020, was in fact the third and longest tenured pastor. He pastored for 35 years from 1975 until May of 2010. He retired in May of 2010, and I had the privilege, the pleasure, the honor, as well as the opportunity of succeeding my grandfather in ministry I never wanted to pastor I started preaching at the tender age of 18 I actually went to school to become a medical doctor I got halfway through college and I recognized that although I had the potential to be a doctor because I had good study habits and I'm able to make good grades I did not have the passion to be a doctor it was in fact the summer headed into my senior year of college I was preaching at a church in Lexington Kentucky and in the middle of me preaching, the Holy Spirit whispered inside of my ear, you'll be doing this the rest of your life. It was too late, ladies and gentlemen, for me to transfer. It was too late for me to get another degree, so I did not get another degree. I went on and got my biology degree, but instead of me taking the MCAT and going to medical school, I decided to return back to Birmingham, Alabama. I enrolled at Beeson Divinity School of Sanford University, but I came back to Birmingham not just to go to school. I came back to Birmingham because the Holy Spirit whispered inside of my ear, I want you to go back home to Birmingham, sit at the feet of your grandfather, and serve your grandfather. I had no clue. I had no idea that one day I'd be succeeding my grandfather in ministry. So here it is, 2004. On one hand, I have a biology degree. On the other hand, I started as the janitor of the church. I'm going to say that again. On one hand, I have a biology degree. On the other hand, I started as the janitor. On one hand, I have a biology degree. On the other hand, I'm scrubbing toilet. Toilets. On one hand, I have a biology degree. On the other hand, I'm wiping and washing windows. On one hand, I have a biology degree, but on the other hand, I'm doing all of these things for the purpose of cleaning up the church. There is a scripture that warrants all of our attention on tonight. It's 1 Peter chapter number 5, beginning with verse number 6. It says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. 
And when you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, God will exalt you in due time. As I'm matriculating through the church, I become the assistant pastor in 2006. In 2010, my grandfather decides to transition. He exits the scene stage right. I enter the scene stage left, and I had the privilege of serving as the pastor of several people who changed my diapers. But although they were familiar with me, they still had questions. I'm going to say it again because somebody just missed it. Although they were familiar with me, they still had questions. The truth about pastoral transitions, number one, if you're taking notes, is that everybody has questions. Look at the person beside you and tell them everybody has questions. Some people are bold enough to verbalize those questions, and then there are some that are pondering these questions inside of their heart. They want to know, who's the new leader? What new vision are they bringing to the table? Should I leave? Should I stay? Do I like the new leader? Do I want to follow, or should I go to another church? Even if you don't verbalize these questions out of People are pondering these questions inside of their heart because the truth about transition is that everybody has questions. Everyone shout, everybody has questions. The second truth about transition is that change is physical, transition is mental. Because change is physical, change takes place in an instant at a moment's notice. The moment that one pastor exits the scene stage right, and the other pastor enters the scene stage left. Everybody sees the change. Everybody knows about the change. It takes place in an instant at a moment's notice because change is physical. Everybody shout change is physical. But although change is physical, transition is mental. Because transition is mental, it takes the minds of people three to seven years to catch up to the change that has already taken place. I'm going to say it again. It takes the minds of people three to seven years to catch up to the change that has already taken place. And I hear you asking questions right where you are. Pastor Beavers, why is it that it takes the minds of people three to seven years to catch up to the change that is already taking place? It takes that long because whenever you pastor a church, there are different mindsets inside of the church. The third truth about transition that warrants all of our attention on tonight is that sometimes transition can take a long time because of the mindsets of people. I contend, Pastor MK, there are four primary mindsets that you will have to deal with in transitioning this church. There's the mindset of park. There's the mindset of reverse. There's the mindset of neutral. And there's the mindset of drive. I'm going to say it again because somebody just missed it. There's the mindset of park. There's the mindset of reverse. There's the mindset of neutral, and there is the mindset of drive. When your car is in park, it is unable to move forward or backwards. It's stuck in the same place because it's already arrived at its destination. When a congregant has a mindset that is in park, this person does not want to go forward or backwards. They are stuck in the same place because they have the nerve and the audacity to think that they've already arrived just because of what it is that God did in the past. Yes, God paid off a $16 million dome cash, but we serve a God that goes from faith to faith and glory to glory. Does anybody believe that we serve a God who Who's able? Does anybody believe that we serve a God who's willing? Does anybody believe that we serve a God who's willing to do it for you? Does anybody believe that he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask and all that we think according to the power that works inside of us? There's the mindset of part. That's the first mindset. The second mindset is the mindset of reverse. These are the people who only want to go backwards and you identify them by their language because they only talk about the good old days. They only talk about what we used to do and how we used to do it. 
And yes, there are appropriate times that we are to look back into the past, but don't make a monument out of the past because you'll hinder yourself from your future. Have you not considered it was, in fact, Paul the Apostle who wrote to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter number 3, verses 13 and 14. He said, not that I've already attained. He said, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are but I got some Bible readers in here. Is the word of God still the answer? Faith Chapel, I'm going to ask that again. Is the word of God still the answer? He says, forgetting those things which are behind. Reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, here's the interesting thing about what Paul says. Everything that he's talking about forgetting is not anything negative. It is only the positive. One thing about Paul is that they question his apostleship. So in Philippians chapter number three, he opens up and he starts talking about this. He says, if anybody has the right to brag about being a, a, an apostle, nobody can brag more than I can. Notice how he lays it out. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel. And that made me the man in the eyesight of the world. He says, I'm not just a Hebrew, but I'm a Hebrew of all Hebrews. That made me the man in the eyesight of the world. Concerning zeal is touching the law. Nobody was a better Pharisee than I was. That made me the man in the eyesight of the world. But then he says, there's one thing that I do. Forgetting those things which are behind. Even if they were somewhat positive in the eyesight of the world, reaching forth to those things which are before, I press. And that's what it's going to take. You're going to have to press. With tears in your eyes, you're going to have to press. With burdens on your shoulder, you're going to have to press. But thank God that although you press, you won't be pressing alone. God is with you. He promised he'd never leave you. He promised he'd never forsake you. He promised he'd be with you always, even until the end of the world. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's the mindset of reverse. But the worst mindset you'll have to deal with is the mindset of neutral. When a car is in neutral, it's liable to go forward or backwards, but it's contingent upon an outside force. When a member is in neutral, they're liable to go forward or backwards, but as long as they've been in church, they do not have the spiritual fortitude and spiritual stick-to-itiveness to make up their own mind. These are the people who have the meeting after the meeting. These are the people that when you lay out vision for the church, then they go home and they have another meeting after the meeting. And they call and say, good, you heard what pastor said? Yeah, I heard what pastor said. What you think about it? Uh, I'm going to leave. If you're going to leave, I'm going to leave too. What you think about it? I'm going to stay. If you're going to stay, I'm going to stay too. You mean to tell me that God has bought you with a price? That he's washed you in the blood of the lamb and you've been sitting up under all of this word for 41 years and still don't have the spiritual maturity and stick to to be able to make up your own mind? If you're going to stay, at least make up your own mind. If you're going to leave, at least make up your own mind. You got to make up your own mind. Somebody shout, my mind is made up. No turning back. Come on, say it again. My mind is made up. No turning back. Sometimes you got to lose your mind to take on the mind of Christ. Sometimes you got to lose your mind to take on the mind of Christ. Let this mind be inside of you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God highly exalted him and has given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee has got to bow. Every tongue has got to confess that Jesus the Christ is Lord. Somebody shout he's Lord. There's the mindset apart. The mindset of reverse. The mindset of neutral. 
But the mindset that we're working to get everybody in is the mindset called drive. When a car is in drive, it only goes forward. When a congregant has the mindset of drive, they move forward by any means necessary. But I think I better pause to parenthetically insert this. There are two different kinds of drivers. You have full throttle drivers. But you also have cautious drivers. Full throttle drivers are the people that when you present the vision to the church, full throttle drivers get excited first. They ask what it costs later. <laughs> Cautious drivers ask what it costs first. They get excited later. Don't be frustrated with your cautious drivers. You need both. <laughs> Full throttle drivers will always keep Faith Chapel from being stagnant. Cautious drivers will always keep Faith Chapel from getting into trouble. So sometimes it takes the minds of the people three to seven years to catch up to the change that is already taking place because of the mindsets of the people. But here's the fourth truth about transition. The fourth truth that I want you to understand tonight about transition is that the man in leadership is going to change. There is a passage of scripture found in Joshua chapter number one. The Bible declares in verse number one, Moses, my servant, is now dead. God, in his infinite wisdom, speaks to Joshua. Joshua, and when he speaks to Joshua, he says, now that Moses is dead, after you mourn over Moses being dead, first and foremost, I just want to pause. Thank God Moses ain't dead. Thank God he's still alive. Thank God he's still well. But he commissions Joshua, now that Moses is dead, take all of the children of Israel, God's chosen people, cross over the Jordan. And in that instant, the man in leadership changed. And I want you to understand on tonight that the man in leadership, Faith Chapel, is changing. But I do not want you to focus on what's getting ready to change. I want you to focus on what's going to remain the same. When you look in Joshua chapter number one, the man in leadership changed, but there were three things that did not change. The first thing that did not change was the mission. Everybody shout the mission. Yeah, that's why times of transition are so tedious inside of the body of Christ because everybody wants to know what's getting ready to change. The mission should never change. The mission of Moses was to get the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. Moses fell short because he allowed church people to make him upset. So God says, I'm going to let you see the promise, but you can't walk in the promise. What a precarious predicament. To have God's precious promises and see them within reach but can't touch them. Because we don't know how to control our emotions. So he says, watch this. The mission should not change because Moses' mission is to get the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. Moses fell short. Joshua got the baton. And when he got the baton, he didn't turn to the left nor the right. He did not go backwards into Egypt, but he went further in the same direction until they made it into the promised land. So Faith Chapel, I want to tell somebody on tonight that although the man in leadership is changing, the mission is not changing. The word of God is still the answer. Does anybody believe that the word of God is the answer? Does anybody believe that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God? The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word shall stand forever. Heaven and earth shall fade away, but not one jot, not one tittle of his word shall fall to the ground. Does anybody believe his word is a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path? Thy word have I hid inside of my heart that I might not sin against him. Somebody shout, his word stands forever. 
The mission is not going to change. Uh, number two, the master does not change. Everybody shout, the master is not changing. Joshua chapter number one, verse five. God speaks to Joshua as I was with Moses. I'll be with you. Same God of Dr. Michael D. Moore. Same God of Pastor MK. Same Savior of Dr. Michael D. Moore. Same Savior of Pastor MK. Same Master of Dr. Michael D. Moore. Same Master of Pastor Michael MK. Why is that? Because the Master does not change. But the third thing that does not change, ladies and gentlemen, the mission doesn't change. The master does not change. The message will not change. The man is going to change. That's going to happen on the night. But I don't want you to focus on what's getting ready to change because if you focus on the man, that means that we are a personality-driven ministry. And I got a sneaking suspicion this ministry is not driven by the personality of the preacher. It's driven by the principles of Jesus the Christ. Whatever you do, please don't be like the church at Corinth. Paul the apostle founded, established that particular church, but because he's an apostle, he goes on to establish other churches. And in his absence, there was a young rising leader by the name of Apollos who steps onto the scene. And would you not believe that the current membership starts to compare Apollos to the former pastor by the name of Paul? Some people say, I like Paul, and if Paul ain't preaching, I ain't coming to church today. I like Apollos. If Apollos ain't preaching, I ain't coming to church today. And Paul had to get them straight. Who is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers of the gospel. We are different men, but we have the same mission. And we got the same message. The message won't change. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, he says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you'll meditate there in it both day and night and observe to do according to all that's written therein. Then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. What book of the law is he talking about? Same book that Moses used when he went up on Mount Sinai for 40 days and he visited with God face to face, came down with the Ten Commandments. Joshua, that's the same book that I want you to use, same Bible that Dr. Michael D. Moore preached from and lived from for 41 years. It's the same Bible that I want you to use. So for anybody who's on the fence on tonight, Yes, the man is changing. But if the mission never changes, if the master never changes, if the message never changes, you owe it to God and yourself to stay put. You owe it to God and yourself to stay planted. You do understand there are benefits for being planted. Psalms 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates both day and night, and he'll be like a tree planted. By the rivers of water, bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf won't wither. Whatever he does shall prosper. But here's the last thing I want to say to everybody, and I'm getting ready to raise up. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this time. I'm humbled and I'm honored. But the last thing I want to say to you, Faith Chapel, from the bottom of my heart, the man is not changing. The man is going to change. The mission is not changing. The master is not changing. The message is not changing. But methods? <laughs> methods change. Tell the person beside you, methods change. The number one scripture that people use in the church to refute change is Hebrews chapter number 13, verse 8. Jesus the same yesterday. Today and forevermore. Don't you bring no change in this church. Jesus is the same. But scripture without a context is not scripture at all. 
I got two women in my church that I'm absolutely in love with. Don't judge me. One is my mother. The other is my wife. I'm in love with both of those women. My mother is over there somewhere. There you go. My wife is right there. If you know my wife but you don't know my mama, and you see me in a room with a woman you know is not my wife, and you see me kiss her, and you see me hug her, and I ain't talking about the side church hug. I'm talking about a full frontal. And you see me look passionately in her eyes and say, I love you with all of my heart. And you don't know who that is, but you know that's not my wife. You automatically assume Pastor Beavers is cheating on his wife until you put it in context. That yes, I'm in a room with a woman all by myself. Yes, I kiss her. Yes, I hug her, give her a full frontal. It's not a church hug. And yes, I look passionately in her eyes and say, I love you. But when you find out that's my mama, it means something totally different. Stop doing a drive-by on scripture. So when you say Jesus the same yesterday, today, forevermore, yes, he's the same. But what that means is his character is the same, but even God changed his methods. In the Old Testament, he has the character of being a forgiven God. In the New Testament, he has the same character of being a forgiven God. But the method by which we get forgiveness in the Old Testament ain't the same method we get forgiveness from in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, in order to be forgiven, you had to go through a man-made priest. He went to the Holy of Holies once a year to atone for the sins of the people. But inside of the New Testament, Jesus became both our high priest and our perfect sacrifice all at the same time. And he went to the cross to atone for the sins of his people, not once a year, but once and for all. So now I get forgiveness and I don't have to go through a man. I get the same forgiveness through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because although his character is the same, God changed his methods. But you don't change methods just to change methods. But whenever you find a more efficient way to do the same thing, make a change. When you find a more efficient way to accomplish the same mission, when God drops inside of your spirit a more efficient way to accomplish the same message. When he drops inside of your spirit a more efficient way to worship the same master. Make the switch. And regardless of who says what about it. As long as you follow God. No devil in hell will be able to stop you. No devil in hell will be able to block you. No devil in hell will be able to stop God's plan for Faith Chapel Christian Church. I love you. you something do you have a witness why I asked him to do it you got that witness that's, that's why I asked him to do it I had a witness that he needed to speak to us you may be seated uh, we're going to move into another part of our service I am <clears throat> Thank you. 
I am going to lead us into some other areas. Before I do that, I want to thank uh, those who were led us in a time of worship. I want to thank Tim and his team. Thank you so very much for leading us in a time of worship. I want to thank Stephen. I don't know if you know this. What scripture were you quoting from when you closed out? You were quoting First Chronicles. I know what you was quoting. You were quoting First Chronicles 28, 20 through 22. That is the exact text that Faith Chapel was born out of. The exact text, exact text. This church, I was reading the Bible. I didn't see a vision, I didn't see a dream, I didn't see none of that. I was reading 1 Chronicles 28 and it lifted off the page and I knew God was telling me, I've chosen you to do a work don't be afraid, don't be dismayed. For I'm your God, I'll be with you. I'll not fail you nor forsake you till you have finished the work of the Lord. And there'll be with you every willing and skillful laborer. I have quoted that for 40 some years, Stephen. 41 years. I was sitting up there thinking, that's the man of God right there. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's a man of God right there. But I, I, I do want to do this, and then I'm going to do something else. I want to thank you, Stephen, for being a mentor to my son. Because every leader needs a leader. I want to thank you, Tony for being a coach to my son because every leader needs a leader and I just I'm eternally grateful to, to both of you for sowing into his life I love him and God brought you into his life to get him to another place so I want to thank you so very much for your deposit amen amen, amen. I, uh, if, you, if you give me a moment, here's where we're going to go. Here's where we're going to go. That's why I asked you to do it. I heard God, didn't I? <laughs> I can hear from heaven. Thomas, I can hear from heaven. <laughs> awesome, man. History. Little history brief history and then I'm going to give a charge and then I'm going to invite will you come up Stephen with us Thomas with us my wife and we're going to we're going to lay hands on them little history Faith Chapel began all, April the 26th 1981 I had been in ministry for a little time. Then four years later, I entered into full-time ministry, September 1985. Down at the church, didn't know anything. I didn't know what I was going to do down there. All I knew was I was supposed to be doing it, but I didn't know what I was doing. And when you don't know what to do, you pray. And the very first day that I was in full-time ministry, Michael was about three years old. And the very first day I'm in full-time ministry, down there by myself, God led me to pray for that little boy. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I didn't know at the time, I didn't know whether I was praying because I was just proud to have a boy, you know, for our first child. But I prayed for him the very first day I was in full-time ministry. Somewhere between two to three, four years later, 
when kids get into the question stage, maybe four, five, six years old, you, you know, when kids ask you questions like, does the sun go to sleep at nighttime? <laughs> like, where does trees come from? He was in that stage, a little kid, he was in that stage. He asked so many questions, you wanted to play the quiet game? <laughs> like, let's see who could be the quietest for just a moment. And out of the clear blue, just a little kid, he said, Daddy, what do I need to do to get the people to make me a pastor? And I said, well, I said, Mike, I said, people didn't make me a pastor. I said, God called me to be a pastor. I said, you got to be call called to be a pastor. I don't know where that kid got that stuff from. I'm the clear blue. But I can't go any further than it because he wouldn't understood it. I, I said, you got to be called, Mike. And, you know, they said, okay, and you just go about your business and let's play the quiet game the rest of the way. <laughs> and, and so we raised our kids, Tiffany and Mike, to just be kids. We didn't want them to be preacher kids. We didn't want them to have pressure on them. So they just lived a, a, a regular life. Gra he graduated from high school, went to college, graduated from college. I never put that thing on him that you're going to be a preacher and you're going to do this and y'all are preacher kids and y'all, we didn't want our kids to have all that. They already have enough pressure on them. So he went off in corporate America, rigless, as, as his friends were saying. I had an unction. I knew he was going to call, but I wanted God to call him. So he called me <laughs> about eight, eight months after he accepted his job. He said, Daddy, he said, I want to I I come home. I'm, are you going to come home? <laughs> uh, he said, yeah, I, I'm called. I said, for real? <laughs> about eight months, and I think you had uh, like a 12-month contract or something like that. I said, no, you can't come home. <laughs> you can't come home. Man, you got to finish them next four months. So he finished the four months, came home, and we put them on the people. I didn't want him over nobody. You can't leave people until you're under somebody. So he was under people for years, being coached and being mentored, and then he met a beautiful, intelligent, wonderful, godly, anointed lady. And, and she was on fire for God and loved God in the church. In fact, she helped do the makeup uh, for, my, uh, for television. And he married this wonderful, beautiful, intelligent, godly, who became our daughter-in-law and then graduated to be our daughter and then they brought these three beautiful girls the most prettiest grandbabies on planet earth <laughs> nobody has any grandbabies greater and prettier than our grandbabies <laughs> and Mike he did different things and finally he was over the finances and she was over uh, arts and worship in the church, and then finally Mike became the executive pastor, and for 10 years, he literally behind the scene ran the church. He was the executive pastor of the church, and I have a lot of practice following him. I told him I'm looking forward to you being my pastor. For 10 years, he led us in strategic planning. For 10 years, he was literally driving the direction of our church, and now we're at this moment in time. So I want to do something, if you all give me permission, but, and you really don't have no choice, because <laughs> I got about, I got another few minutes to be the pastor. <laughs> I tell you something. I'm, I'm gonna give a charge. I'm gonna give a charge. Pete, my wife, that's her nickname. She's been telling me that the anointing is dripping off of me. <laughs> <laughs> she told me before we left the house, she said, You got about one eighth of anointing. 
<laughs> you think you got about one eighth? You just got about one more, one eighth of a loyalty to be the pastor. We hit 20th Street instantly. When we hit 20th Street, she looked at me and she said, "This is the last time." <laughs> yeah, she did. She said, "This is the last time you're gonna drive down this street to be the pastor of the church." So. <laughs> Since it's my last time, <laughs> I want to give you a charge. I want to give you a charge. I'm going to let you sit there. I want to give you a charge. And then we're going to come up and then we're going to lay hands on you. And I believe God is going to do something supernatural. Mike, I don't know if you remember this, but we licensed you May the 10th, 20, 2013. And at that time, I shared this text. I want to share the same text and this charge to you. There are five principles or core values for success in ministry. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, verse 12 through 16. And Paul is exhorting Timothy to keep a sharp eye on his public life and his private life. And he gives five core values, and the first core value, 1 Timothy 4.13, he exhorts Timothy to be an example. Be thou an example of the believer. That's a core value of a successful pastor. In other words, success is not just what you do. Success is who you are. Amen. What you do should be an extension of who you are. He's exhorting him to be an example. In other words, he wants his private life and his public life to match. Amen. That's wholeness when you what people see on the pulpit and what your family see in private, it matches. Being an example gives you the moral authority to stand in front of people with boldness and confidence. So be an example, Mike. Be an example, Michelle. Don't be a fraud. Don't be a fraud. Amen. The second core value, he exhorts Timothy to be a lifetime student. Verse 13, give attention to reading. Pastors are food factories. That's what we are. Ever listening, ever learning, ever observing, ever sitting at the feet of others who know more, doing more, farther along, a student of the word, a student of people, and a student of yourself, a lifetime student. You're going to enter in a realm when we lay hands on you, Mike, Michelle, the Spirit of God is going to begin to unveil this pastoring thing. And he's going to ex expose you to insight and wisdom that he couldn't expose you to before now. But you have to be a diligent student, lifetime student. The third core value is found in verse 14. Do not neglect the gift in you. Be true to yourself. Be true to yourself. You're unique. You are unique. You have unique personalities. You have a unique calling. You have unique giftings. And you fit your assignment. You fit it. You don't have to be anybody else God created you to fit 
this assignment. So avoid comparisons. The Bible says that they that compare themselves with others and uh, measure themselves by others, it says that they're not wise. Be yourself, Michelle. Be you. Don't try to be what everybody else want you to be. Be yourself, Mike. You've been taught to be you. Stay within the jurisdiction that God has given you. Stay in your lane, Mike. My Lord. Paul said, I stretch my, not myself above, beyond my measure. You're going to see people and you're going to admire people and you're going to support them and you're going to undergird them, but don't try to do it. Don't try to do what other folks try. Stay within the limits of your jurisdiction. And if you stay in that limit, you'll have all the people resources, you'll have all the financial resources, you'll have everything you need if you stay within the limits of your jurisdiction. Being true to yourself means to know what you're called to do, but also know what you're not called to do. Know what you're called to do, but know what you're not called to do. Then the fourth core value is being inspiration. In verse 15, he says, meditate upon these things. Give yourself wholly to them that your profiting may appear to all. Listen, God wants you to profit. He said, your profiting will appear to all. Why? Because people need inspiration. They need, they, need the, they need the inspiration of seeing their leader stand on that vision and stand on that word, even in adversity. They need the inspiration of seeing somebody doing the right thing the right way. Because they have dreams and they have goals and they have goals. And when they see their man of God and their woman of God stand on the word and see a manifestation, it spills over into their lives. And they believe that they can do what God called them to do because they saw their man of God do what he or she was called to do. So be an inspiration. The fifth core value, number one, be an example. Number two, be a lifetime student. Number three, be true to yourself. Number four, be an inspiration. But number five, Mike, is so important. Michelle is so important. It's so very important. Be diligent to take care of yourself. Be diligent to take care of yourself. Verse 16 says, take heed to yourselves and to the doctrine. He said, continue to do this because in doing this, you'll not just save others. You'll save yourself and then you'll save others. The apostle Paul said the same thing in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. He was given a farewell address to the pastors of Ephesus in Miletus. And here's what he said in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. The same thing he said to Timothy. He said, take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the flock. Now, notice carefully, notice carefully, take heed to yourself, then the doctrine. Take heed to yourself, then the flock. In other words, don't neglect yourself. Don't neglect yourself. Don't neglect yourself. Don't neglect your time with God. Don't get so busy telling folk and teaching folk and doing this that you neglect yourself. Don't neglect. You won't know how to tell these folk. You won't know how to guide them. You won't even know how to feed them if you don't spend time with God. Don't neglect that time. That's your precious moment. That's your precious thing. That's going to give you the edge. If you don't spend time with God, Mike, you'll you'll teach facts and you'll teach this and logic and all this other kind of stuff. But if you spend time with God, 
If you spend time with God, God will resource everything he tells you to do. But watch this. Taking care of yourself is not just about spending time with God. It's about spending time with Michelle. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, don't get so busy that you don't spend time with that girl. What we do or don't do in our private life will manifest in our public life. So if you don't spend time with her and give all these people time, it's going to manifest in your public life. Spend time with your kids. We spend time with y'all. You spend time with them little girls. And if you have to choose doing some I hear and going to their concerts and going to whatever they do and going to their baseball games, you go to the baseball game. You take care of yourself. Take care, take care of yourself. Yourself, your family, take care of your, your, your spiritual health. You can't spend time just preparing sermons. Feed yourself. Take care of your spiritual self. Take care of your physical self. Exercise. This is the only thing God can use is your body. You got to take care of this. You got to rest this. Take care of your mind, Mike. Let me share something with you. Guard your mind from worry. People worry about things that they own. Now follow me. I want you to listen carefully because it's easy to worry in ministry. People worry about things they own. The reason why you and Michelle don't worry about your neighbor's house note, (laughs) you don't worry about their car payment, you don't even worry about if they kicked out of their house because you don't own it. You own the house. People worry about things that they own. You don't own these buildings. I never owned them, and you ain't gonna own them. You don't own this land. I never owned it. You never gonna own it. You ain't gonna own none of these folk following you. Jesus owned these folk. Jesus owned this building. Jesus owned this land. Jesus owned this land. If God can't help them, Let God worry about them. They his. They ain't yours. Go to sleep at night. Y'all be quiet. I'm going to go to sleep right now. <laughs> I'm going to sleep right now. Listen, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, don't let folk get in you. These, these Jesus people, they're not your people. They belong to him. To him. You feed them. You be an example. You love them. You care about it, and then you go home and sleep. Come on, come up, Pete. Stephen, will you come up with us? Thomas, will you come up with us? Uh, the passing of the torch come up Ronald with the with everything come up with the <clears throat> there is a principle that we're endeavoring to follow from the Bible in, in Numbers 27 God told Moses to bring Joshua in front of the people and give him a charge. I just gave him a charge. And then he said, I want you to lay your hands on them. 
Now, it, it, it's, it's things that God has put in them that nobody can put on them. My hands is not going to put what God has already put in them. But I am endorsing them publicly. And I believe that there is a grace that God has placed on my life to stand in this office. When I lay my hands and when the elders, the pastors, we lay our hands and my wife lay our hands on them, I believe that what's already in them is going to come forth. Because it couldn't come forth because I was in the way. But when I step out of the way, all the that God has put on the inside of them is going to begin to manifest. And then I also believe this, that the grace that God has placed on my life to stand and to lead, I believe it's going to be supernaturally released from me to them. And they're going to stand in that place and then I will become a follower of them. I, they will become my pastor. I believe that there's something supernatural that happens through the laying on of hands. So will you do this? Will you stand for just a moment? Stephen, will you get on this side? Thomas, will you get on that side? Pete, will you stand in the middle? Will you just touch them? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this vision. We thank you for the grace that you've given us for 41 years. We thank you for the role and the position that you've placed us in. Now, by faith, we lay hands on Michael and Michelle and I pray that the graces, the anointings, the giftings that you've already placed on the inside of them. I pray that those giftings and anointings and the equipment come forth into free wishing. I pray that they see what they've not seen, hear what they've not heard. I pray that they have clarity, clarity. Give Michael clarity to hear your voice. Clearly, clarity of direction. Anoint his words, anoint his mind. Feed his spirit. Give Michelle wisdom, knowledge, and understanding and grace to support, to partner, and to be with him. Now, Father, I Release now by faith the grace that you've placed on my life, the anointing to lead this flock. I release that grace over to my son in the name of Jesus. And I pray that your will be done. Your will be done. Your will be done. In Jesus' name. Is there anything you would like to say? Is there anything you sense that you should say? Thank you. Thank you so very much. You remain standing. I want to do something symbolic. This is the symbolic passing of the torch of leadership as the lead pastor of Faith Chapel we give this to you in Jesus name and this certificate of ordination says this certifies that Pastor Michael K. Moore having responded to the call of God to Christian ministry and having satisfied all the biblical requirements for ordination as lead pastor 
We, the ordination council, having given careful examination as to the moral character, soundness of doctrine, and leadership qualifications of this person of the work of the ministry, do hereby award this certificate from Faith Chapel Church and me as founding pastors. We give this to you in Jesus' name. And I want you, I want you to welcome through your applause. I want you to welcome the senior pastor of Faith Chapel. Yes! You're my pastor. You are my <laughs> Y'all may be seated. How many excited people here? You my past. Will you stay there for just a moment? My wife now is going to Miss Tiffany, Tiffany Moore. We're going to speak as mother and sister. Some of that sister go first. <laughs> Thank you, girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say to Lady Shell and Bishop Michael. <laughs> earlier in our group chat said that we're going to be um, covering you, fighting our battles physically and spiritually for you guys. So I will be the ghetto ratchet sister doing that for you, okay? Um, but no, I'm just proud of y'all and I just, it's going to be colossal like what you said and I'm looking forward to it and um, I'm so honored and proud of y'all. I love you, Shell. And as your mom, you know, Mike was was the child, our first kid that we we prayed, we stood on scriptures for you. And when Michael K. was born, uh, he was born with pneumonia, and it didn't look good. The doctors didn't think you was going to make it. But me and Pastor Mike stood on God's word. And the next day they came in, and they said that uh, you were a miracle, that the pneumonia was gone. But Satan tried to get you. But me and Pastor Mike, we covered you in prayer. And we're going to continue to cover you in prayer. And I, I be that mama. I will fight any Negro <laughs> that come up against my son in the name of Jesus. I be that mama. And, and, and I'm sure your mama too, uh, uh, Mr. Beavers. Yeah, I be that mama. Well, the other day, I'm a journaler. I journal. I journal because I want to leave a legacy for my grandkids, what Gigi was thinking and talking about. So the other day I was in a store, I wasn't even thinking about you. I was looking for a journal for me, because I journal a lot. And when I saw this journal, God told me to get it for you. And I prayed that this journal uh, will be an encouragement for you, because you're going to have some good days, and you're going to have some bad days. And so it says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, Michael K. and Michelle. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua 1.9. 42 years of ministry, um, been by his side, seen a lot of stuff, seen a lot of difficult people, seen a lot more loving people than difficult. But uh, Pastor Mike gave you a charge. Remember this. Love God's people. Don't abuse God's people. God's people may not always act right, but like he said, they're not your people. They're God's people. And one of the habits that your dad has is he journals also. 
And when God gives him words, he writes it down. And I was telling you this the other day. I said, when God talks to you, write it down. Because in those difficult days, when things not going right, money funny, people retarded and acting retarded, <laughs> God give you a word, you stand with that word. So this is a little journal that I bought for you because I like the journal, your dad likes the journal. And we pray you're going to like the journal. Uh, and, and when God gives you those words, Pastor Mike, he, he, he writes them down. And I've seen him when it didn't look good. The money was funny. He had a scripture or, or vision, a night vision or a word from God, and he stood on it. We've stood for, for people in this church. We've stood for finances. We've stood for a lot of stuff. So as a token, I bought this for you. And inside it's got some money, so don't throw that down now. Don't throw that down. <laughs> Because you're my pastor, too, and I want to support you. And then while I was sitting there, the Lord said, it's got some money, but I'm going to bless you, too, Sister um, Michelle, because y'all are one. And so as a token of, from me to you, that's a journal. And what I want to say to you, Michelle, Pastor Mike gave a charge, and he haven't been a pastor's wife. He's been a pastor. I've been a pastor's wife. Be you. You know, uh, I didn't grow up in a Christian environment. When I first became a pastor's wife, they was trying to make me everything. Had hats and sing and <laughs> usher. And I, ca I can't be that person. I couldn't be that person. I'm me. I ain't wearing no lady ch suits, church lady suits, church lady hats. Ain't nothing wrong with it if you want to do it. But be you. When I found out what God wanted me to do, and that was to educate children in the Word of God, from that point on, my mission, I was happy in that. Couldn't sing, couldn't preach, couldn't do a lot of stuff what they said first ladies do. But I wasn't the first lady. I was the only lady, you know. Like that. <laughs> so and when I passed that anointment <laughs> to you, it wasn't first lady because I ain't never been first lady. I've been the only lady. And I'm believing you're going to be the only lady for Pastor Michael K also. So just want to say, love you and be yourself. Love God's people. And he is faithful to do everything he said he's going to do. He's been faithful with us. And he's going to be faithful with you. And we look forward. And I be that mama that's over there in that corner. I'm going to pray for you, child. I'm praying for both of y'all. praying for my grandchildren. I'm going to be an intercessor for this ministry. And if there ain't nobody else praying, know your mama and your mother-in-law is praying for y'all. I love y'all, and I'm looking forward to what all God, because see, the devil tried to stop you, Mike. You got some mighty stuff to do in the future. And, I, and I'm with you, your, your dad with you, your sister with you, and we're going to intercede, and we're going to help you. We're not going to be a hindrance. I don't want to be first lady no more, only lady no more. And he don't want to be pastor no more. Y'all are pastor and lady, first lady, only lady, whatever lady you are. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all going to be that person and me and your daddy and your sister, we going to be behind you. Love you. So right now I would like to call the board of directors up. You all may be seated for just a few moments. And they have a special presentation for you. Hey, Pete, uh, Tiffany, bring the kids so they'll be up here. So the board of directors has a special presentation to our pastor and what are you, Michelle? Let's get that scrape right now. What are you? She's Michelle. So, Pastor Michael K. and Michelle, the board has a special presentation for you. They're going to be up here when they finish. Am I on? Yeah. Okay. Hello. My name is Tina Tyus, and I am here on behalf of the board of directors. Uh, can I get our board of directors to stand? They, they, they're behind you. Okay. Well, you are standing. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, as I've heard so many things, and this is 
been an amazing, amazing night. But it's been an amazing journey. My daughters both ran track. And everything, when I was thinking about you guys earlier, I could hear ready. directors, we want to thank you for not just 10 years of being behind the scenes and running a church, but for your whole life journey of sitting under a, a national prophet, a prophet to the nation, and for being obedient and for being humble. And we've watched that. Thank you for being set, for allowing this to be your set place and being obedient to God to be right here for us. And then as you go, we want you to know that as God was with Pastor, he'll be with you. And as the board of directors have been praying for Pastor, yes. we will yes. pray for you. Yes. And as we have supported the ministry and all of the things that God has put yes. as a charge for our pastor, we will be there for you. So, Please accept this as a token of our love and appreciation to you and Lady Shale. I like that. I heard somebody say it, and it caught on. So I'm excited, and for these little sweet angels, I know that it is a family affair, and we are your Faith, Cham Faith Chapel family. So we're excited about the go and where you're going to lead us to. So thank you for hearing from God, and we're hearing from God, and we'll be there. Thank you. Will you give our board of uh, directors a good hand, please? At this time, we're going to have closing remarks from our new pastor and his family. Uh -uh. an amazing evening such an amazing moment and literally as I was driving in I was overwhelmed with gratitude and um, just humbled by all the the support that I saw from the cars and all the people that put all the work into making this such a special night um, just overwhelmed with gratitude and I thought about actually the story that Pastor Mike shared I've heard so many times about how um, your first day of ministry when Mike was three years old, God laid it on your heart to pray about him and to think about the fact that God had you do that and we're here right now. It just reminded me of the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God because we can't take it for granted that he's here. I mean, he could be somewhere else, you know, he could not want to fulfill this call. And so uh, that was just an amazing thought for me. And so, Mike, I want to say to you, um, you know, I've said it before, that I, I get the privilege of seeing you in places and in spaces that no one else sees you. And I see your diligence to lean and depend on the Holy Spirit to walk in this assignment. I see your commitment to study in the natural, uh, books, mentors, coaching, you're a lifelong learner. I see your heart. 
I see your love for people. I see your dedication and your commitment. And in all of that seeing, I'm very excited to call you my pastor. Um, I love you greatly, deeply. Um, I'm excited to support you, however that looks, um, in this next role. And um, Pastor Thomas, I am the gold driver. And so Faith Chapel, I say to you, um, let's go, let's do it. <laughs> Okay, my heel is calling caught in the vent. Thank you, Mr. Sellers. Can you tell me your name? We love you, Daddy and Poppy. We proud of you, mommy and daddy. I am, thank you. Thank you so much. You can be seated. Michelle used a word that is how I feel. It doesn't feel like it's big enough, but I'm grateful. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful that you all are here. I'm grateful for all of those who are watching online. Uh, you didn't have to be here. You didn't have to invest time. You didn't have to, to show up to participate in this event. You didn't come into this building. You didn't turn on this broadcast by accident. You made a choice. You made a choice to carve out time. So I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful and so honored to, to share this moment with you. But as I've mentioned over the previous weeks, gratitude is a feeling. But in order for it to bless others, it has to be expressed through words or through actions. So I want to I want to quickly thank a few people. It may sound cliche, but I mean it from my heart. I want to thank my Heavenly Father. I want to thank Jesus. I want to thank the Holy Spirit. I'm not up here without them. I'm not up here without them. And there have been so many times where I've disobeyed God and I wouldn't have picked me. And he never gave up on me. He never threw me away. And so I'm grateful for him calling me. Uh, Pastor Mike charged me and told me, Faith Chapel, that you're not mine, and I know that. Um, I'm convinced of that. Uh, you are Jesus' church. He could have picked anybody in the world to follow Pastor Mike to stand in this office. The fact that he's given me this opportunity, I'm grateful for Jesus because you're his church, and I'm grateful for my partner. I have two life partners. That may sound weird. I have the Holy Spirit. I have my other life partner, Michelle. And I'm grateful for the Holy Spirit's partnership in life and in ministry. My family is here. I have family in state, family from out of state. I want my family to know that I love them. I want them to know that I appreciate them. My siblings, um, I told you privately, but I want to tell you publicly, I have your back. Thank you, and I, and I love you. I want to especially shout out my sister, Tiffany. Tiffany, I love you, and I'm so proud of you. You said that you have my back. I just wanted you to know that I have yours. I also wanted to thank my godmother, Minister Deup. She was Faith Chapel's first executive pastor before we ever had the title, before we knew to call that role. She's been a mentor to me. She's been a coach to me. Uh, she's held me accountable. Are you spending time with your family? 
Are you investing in your marriage? So Minister Deb, I want to publicly thank you. Um, we have governmental leaders. Commissioner Scales, I see you. I want to thank you for your leadership. I see Councillor J.T. Moore. I want to thank you for, for your leadership in our city. Um, Tim Bowman, did you all enjoy him tonight? I want to thank you, man of God. My family loves your family. My kids and I listen to your music all the time. In fact, we listen to it on the way here. So I want to thank you for your presence. Thank you for your ministry. Um, my friends have too many friends to name. If I start calling too many names, I'll get in trouble. But three of my best friends you heard on the screen, uh, Caesar Walker, Craig Jelks, and Terry Smith. I love you. You're my brothers, and I'm grateful for you. We have several pastors and ministers. If you're a pastor, if you're a minister in any way, can you stand? I want to acknowledge you and thank you for, for your presence. Thank you, men of God, women of God, for being here. I know that Faith Chapel is just one piece in a bigger puzzle. I know that we have a part to play in the body of Christ, but you do as well. And so I'm grateful. I'm grateful, men and women of God, for your sacrifice. When we come together in God's kingdom, people won't just see us. They'll see Jesus. So I'm thankful for your sacrifice. I'm thankful and grateful and wanted to express my gratitude for our staff and our volunteers. We have an amazing staff. We have amazing volunteers. When I was in Little League, I played baseball. I wasn't really good when I, when I started out. But I hung at it, got some coaching, and I eventually got good enough to make the all-star team. When you hit the all-star team, everybody on the team can hit. When you hit the all-star team, everybody can feel, everybody is great at what they do. That's how I see our staff. That's how I see our volunteers, your all-stars. You're great at what you do. You're super committed. Faith Chapel would not be what it is without your sacrifice, so I wanted to thank you. I wanted to publicly thank you, Pastor Naomi and Emery, for your leadership in Columbus. Thank you for your sacrifice. I wanted to thank you, Minister Jermaine, our next executive pastor. I love you. You are my brother, and I'm grateful for all that you do for our ministry, seen and unseen. I, pub I wanted to publicly thank Sharita Brown, I wanted to publicly thank Priscilla Reynolds and Ronnie McCall for their leadership in helping to pull all of this together. And I wanted to publicly thank my mentors and my coaches. And 10 years ago, 10 years ago, I was promoted to the role of executive pastor, didn't know any executive pastors, didn't know how to do that role, didn't want to fail, wanted to do a good job. And I had been taught well enough to know if you're in a moment, you don't know what to do, you have the Holy Spirit. You have a partner who can help you to give you wisdom. So I told the Holy Spirit, I said, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm in a new role. I don't want to fail. I want to serve. Well, Holy Spirit, I need some help. And 10 years ago, after I prayed that prayer, he led me to a blog post that was so helpful for me. He led me to resources. I began to follow this, this man's blog. I began to take principles that he was sharing. I would take them back to our staff meeting. They thought that I was so smart. It won my ideas. I was just taking what he taught on the blog. God eventually allowed me to sit under him. He was a coach for me for several years. I had the opportunity to travel across the country with him um, and serving with him to serve local churches. And so he's here. Tony Morgan, I want to thank you for your investment in me. I want to thank you for your leadership. Emily, I want to thank you. Both of you opened up your home to me when you didn't have to. And so I'm super grateful for you. Fast forward 10 years. Fast forward 10 years. I'm getting ready to leave out of executive pastor, get into the role of lead pastor. Never been one. Been around it, but never sat in that seat. And I ran the same play. Holy Spirit, I need some help. I need you to send me someone who can pour into me. He sent me two people. He sent me Pastor Mike, who's been coaching me throughout this year. But he sent me Pastor Stephen Chandler. And I want to publicly thank you, sir, for your coaching, for your mentorship. You also opened up your home um, to me. And I feel equipped. I feel prepared because of the investment that you've, you've made. 
I want to shout out my girls, Megan Moore, Margot, and Mikey Rose Moore. I love being your daddy. You are amazing to me. And I make a commitment to the three of you to never let church become a greater priority than you. You are my first ministry. I love you both. And I'm so grateful to be, be your dad. I want to publicly thank my wife, Michelle. Michelle, thank you for saying yes. Thank you for saying I do over 10 years ago. I enjoy being your partner. I want you to know that I have your back and I'm excited to go on this journey with you. And I want to thank my mom and my dad. Uh, mom, you've been there for me literally all of my life. Be it t-ball, be it setting up a dorm in college. Um, when I'm a bachelor, didn't know how to cook you, bring me meals. I want to I wanna thank you for your support. Not just the support that people see publicly, but I want to thank you for your support privately. Over the years, Pastor Mike, you are amazing. You are amazing. I want to thank you for not just preaching God's word, but living it. Not just teaching sermons about God, but modeling him for me, for our church family. It's an incredible honor. It's an incredible honor to, to partner with you in ministry, to succeed you in this role. We're changing titles, but our partnership is not changing. Wherever God sends you, I want you to know that I have your back. I'm excited to partner with you in this new journey, and I want you to know that I love you. And to my Faith Chapel family, my Faith Chapel Birmingham family, my Faith Chapel Columbus family, I want you to know that I love you. I want you to know that I love you. It's not, it's not just words. I love you and I love you big. I make a commitment to you to stay before God. I make a commitment to you to be an example. No pastor is perfect. When I miss it, I'll let you know. When I, when I, when I miss it, I'll come before you and say, hey, I didn't say that right. I didn't do that right but I make a commitment to be an example to you. I'm in such great expectation. When we announced the transition this summer, Pastor Mike gave a prophetic word for us. It was for us corporately and it was for us individually. It was Job chapter eight, verse seven. And it said that though we started with little, yet you will end with much. I want you to know Faith Chapel that we started in a four-room, not a four-bedroom house, a four-room house. We started with little, but our faith was big. And God has told us that we'll end with much. I'm committed to praying for you. I'm committed to seeking God on your behalf. I want you to know that I love you. And God told Pastor Mike, and I'm standing in faith for this, that as faithful as he's been, as big of testimonies as he's given us in the past, our best days, our biggest testimonies are still in front of us. I believe God, I'm standing in faith, and I want you to know that I love you so, so much. It's an honor, it's an honor to serve you. I'm on this platform, but it's not lost on me <laughs> that this transition it's just giving me a bigger opportunity to serve you, a bigger opportunity to, to, to stand before God on, on your behalf. As, as Dr. Thomas said, our mission isn't changing. We're still called to feed you God's word. We're still called to grow you up. We're still going to reach a lot of people who are far from God, and we want to make sure that we don't leave on the table anything that Jesus died for us to have. I love you. I appreciate you. Thank you so much again for coming out to this ceremony. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our announcer who will close us out. Faith Chapel, special guest in Freeland. Thank you for celebrating with us tonight as we at Faith Chapel continue the legacy 
This concludes our ceremony for this evening. We wish you safe travels to your next destination. God bless you. <laughs>